morning. Well, praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll open up your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter 10. And uh, we're going to get there in a little bit. How many of you ever felt like um, you were a day late and a dollar short? You ever felt like you got someplace and the sale ended yesterday? You got some place and, uh, and, and it just seems like they ran out right before you got there. Have you ever been to the place where you just, you, you, you left and you just say, man, I was at the right place at the right time. Have you ever felt that way? Just a couple of days ago, Pastor B and I uh, went to a, a, a local department store. And, uh, you know, we're, I was, uh, those of you who knew, I've, I've lost about 50 pounds over the last number of years. And so I was wearing uh, my older clothes and, and all of it was big. And, and some people graciously told Pastor B that, that we need to buy Pastor a new suit. Um, those look, he looks like they're hand-me-downs. Uh, and, and so uh, Pastor B said I was wearing tents. And so it was time to get a, a, a little bit more updated wardrobe. And so we went and, and you know, we found that this one, one place they had clearance. And I bought a sport coat, a $160 sport coat for $49.95. And you put it on your credit card and you were able to get another 20% off. So I walked out with a sport coat, one just like this for for just you know real cheap so I figured man we're the right place at the right time how many of you ever been to a to place somebody says well Dillard's is running the sale and you run over there and it ended yesterday (laughs) why am I late you see in life there are moments there are seasons and there are times when when we have to be at the right place we have to be at the right time in order for us to seize that opportunity seize that moment because that moment can be fleeting that moment can be can be so fleeting that if we're if we're just seconds late we miss it. And so it's important to recognize, we're going to look at a classic story in the scriptures of a man who was at the right place physically and the right place spiritually. You realize that you can be in the right place physically, but not be in the right place spiritually and miss out on what God has for you. But I guarantee you that if you're in the right place spiritually and you're led by the Spirit, He will bring you to the right place physically. Because God doesn't want you to miss out on His grace, miss out on His goodness, and miss out what He intends for you. Oral Roberts said this in one of his books. It just stuck with me when I read it. It's like it just, it just latched on to my heart and, and it just won't let go. He says, your miracle is either coming your way or passing you by. And it's all a matter of recognition. It's all a matter of recognizing that moment, that, 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 that sensation. And very often, we, we don't recognize the moment for what it is. Because it may look like any other moment, any other routine, any other day. And all of a sudden, that day, that moment turns into a, an opportunity that changes your life forever the challenge is we need to recognize that moment the story here in Mark chapter 10 verse 46 it says now they came to Jericho and as he Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude blind Bartimaeus the son of Timaeus sat by the roadside begging And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he he cried out all the more, 
Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received this sight and followed Jesus on the road. There's a lot in that verse of scripture. But if we're not careful, all we see is the surface. All we see is what happens to Bartimaeus. All we see is some of them, the, some of the overall features, the overall things that take place. I want you to know that he had to be at the right place. He had to get into position. Now you recognize Bartimaeus was blind. And more than likely, that was his routine. Day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out to go to that corner, to go to that spot on that street. That was his territory. That was where he begged for alms. And more than likely, every day, he would say, he'd cry out, alms, alms for the blind, alms for the blind. And every day he did that. What would have happened? At that morning, he said, I don't feel like going over there today. I think I'm going to stay home and get a little extra sleep. I don't believe I'm going to go to my spot that I've been. And nothing happens in that place. Somebody drops me a coin every few hours. Somebody drops me a coin and I hear all of the world going by. I hear all of the rustle and bustle. I hear all of the people going by living their life and mine is stagnant. Mine is dead. All I'm doing is just begging. I think I'm going to stay home. Life is not fair. What would have happened on the one day that Jesus is coming by? Now, undoubtedly, Jesus may have gone in and out of Jerusalem more than once. I'm sorry, Jericho more than once. But in this case, this was absolutely the last time he goes to Jericho. The last time he's leaving Jericho. Had, had Bartimaeus missed it at that moment, he would have missed it. For the rest of his life. And I say that to say this. You know there's sometimes that we, 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 we hear the announcement. We, we, we go to church and we, we do a routine. And we get into a habit and we do this and we do that. And it just doesn't seem like anything is really happening. Well why do I want to go back to church? Pastor's always teaching on faith. Or pastor's always teaching on prosperity. Or, or, or we get this and we get that. We got three songs of sermon. We go home. There just doesn't seem to be anything. Listen you never know when the spirit of God's going to show up and this will be your service and it'll be your moment your opportunity it's not a matter of what you didn't get in the past it's a matter of what you can get today and you know it's not just it's not just going to church it's it's prayer it's spending time in the presence of God it's doing all of those things to get us into that position so that we can receive you realize he was in the physical place the word says that his name was Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And that's what Bartimaeus means. The word Bart means son of or son of Timaeus. And, and, and the research that I've done, he was the son of someone who was highly prized. Someone who was honorable. And well, how, how low and how humiliating and how uh, uh, digressing it is for a man whose son is at the gate begging for alms. And, and, and you know, I don't know how old Bartimaeus was, but when you look at the word blind, it says that it, it, it really has some connotation of being cloudy. My indication, my heart says the man was up in age and now he has cataracts and he can't see. I don't know if that's the case. I'm not sure if that's it or not. But it's possible that could be the case. 
But he legitimized, he was legal in begging because he had that. See, Bartimaeus was a fixture on that corner. He had the garment that gave him the right to be able to beg and to ask for alms. And Bartimaeus was at that right place, at that right time, begging. It was his routine. It's what he was always doing. And so it's important to be at the right place physically. But there's something else that brought Bartimaeus to a place of spiritual rightness or uh, in the right place spiritually. Notice there was something about it in, in the Gospel of Luke. It says he heard about Jesus. He heard that it was Jesus. And undoubtedly, I'm thinking Bartimaeus is a routine. He is sitting on that street corner. And, and have you ever put something on your refrigerator that you say that, you know, you, you put it there because it's important and you want to pray for it? Or maybe your bathroom mirror. And after a week, you no longer see it. After a week, you no longer see that thing on your refrigerator. You open and close it hundreds of times a, a week. And, and that picture, that saying, that thing that you want to keep before your eyes, you don't see it anymore. Why? Because it's routine. I believe that's what was happening with Bartimaeus. He was at that street corner. People would go by, off, back and forth, back and forth. And nobody paid him any attention. Just every once in a while, somebody would drop in a coin in his little bucket. Back in the 70s, when I worked for my dad, we would travel the Evangeline Thruway to and from work. And there was a large man, probably disabled, sitting on every single day until one day he wasn't there. And I'd, I'd see him every day. I'd, I'd drive by and think, what a boring life. I don't know him. I didn't know what was going on in his life. I don't know why he was in that place. But we drive by every day. Until one day, he's not there. And that chair stayed there for years after. He was not there. And I'm thinking, that just kind of remind me, this is Bartimaeus. People walked by him and he was, he was there, but he wasn't there. And undoubtedly, he's hearing the people talk about this, this Jesus and how he opened blind eyes and he opened deaf ears and he made the lame walk and he raised people from the dead and he heard about this Jesus and something inside of him said, if that Jesus ever comes down my road, I'm not going to let him go by without me grabbing hold of what it is I need. I'm going to seize that moment. I'm going to seize that opportunity. And so when they come and there's a tumult, there's a, there's a multitude, there's a crowd. And, and so he asked, what is this all about? And they said, it's, it's Jesus. <laughs> he said, here it goes. Here I am. I am in the right place at the right time. I am going to get my Miracle, I'm going to get my answer. And so he began, see what happened was, see faith comes when we hear something. Faith comes when we hear the word of God, when we hear God's word in our heart, when we hear it not just with our natural ears, but we hear it down in the recesses of our heart. Faith comes and it begs for action. Faith comes and it gives us the, the, the fortitude, the, the courage, the boldness to step out. And see, if, if all we do is hear and we don't act upon it, then, then it's just dead. That's what James tells us us it's not alive on the inside of us but by faith comes by by hearing by studying by 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 speaking it out and then and then we act upon it. and what was his action his action was his shouting out his crying out it's interesting because the two words cry are not the same the first one was uh, Jesus son of David have mercy on me and then it says that they tried to keep him quiet and he just went a couple of octaves louder. Jesus! 
son of David, have mercy on me. See, he cried a whole lot louder the second time. Why? Because he recognized, I am not going to let those things quiet me. So what, what we see is that faith was there. And then there was something about him that says, call on mercy. You know, um, faith without humility will never get answers from God. You see, faith plus humility and worship puts you in the right place spiritually. What he was doing was he was acknowledging David, uh, Jesus as the son of David, saying, you are the Messiah. You're the promised one. You are the one upon whom the kingdoms of all the earth will be placed. You are the Messiah. He wasn't saying it, per just those words, that you're the Messiah, that you are the Christ, but in his his reference that's what he was saying and I'm worshiping you and and, and listen Jesus I, I, I need your help I need your help I can't do it alone you see humility is nothing more than recognizing that by ourselves we're nothing doesn't matter what education you have, no matter how fast you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how rich you are without God you're nothing and it's recognizing that you can have all the money in the world and still be the humblest person on planet earth because you recognize it's only in your life because God brought it. You can be the smartest person and have the greatest IQ and still be a humble person because you recognize your gifting to understand and comprehend and have knowledge only came because God graced you. You see, so I'm believing that this man was in the right place spiritually. He was in faith. He was humble. And he was worshiping God. And so we got to recognize that moment. And I believe he saw this place. He saw this moment. And he recognized this moment. It was there for him to, to receive what he needed. A, a number of years ago, back many, many years ago, there was a, a man and, and by the name of uh, uh, Walt Disney. You remember... You know, you may have seen his pictures of him. I've never met him personally. But, but you know, I've heard, of his, I've heard of his Walt Disney World. And I've heard of Disneyland. Do you know that one day uh, when this Walt Disney World and Disneyland was nothing more than a glimmer in his eye, nothing more than a, a wild, sketchy idea in his heart, he and one of his friends went out to the uh, Southern California desert and he started telling him, we're going to build an amusement park and we're going to have a water park and we're going to have a place where people can, families can come and people can go. Do you see it? And he He's painting this picture to his friend and his friend says you've been in the sun too long there's nothing out there there'll never be anything out there you are wasting your time and mine he gave him an opportunity. He says, why don't you come in with me and we'll invest in this thing. We'll buy up this land and he said we will be rich we will make all kinds of money and the guy looked at him and said, no, thank you. The man's name was Art Linkletter. <laughs> now, he did well on his own without Walt, without Walt Disney. But can you imagine? Have you ever been in a place where you'd say, man, I could just kick myself for not doing that for not buying that, for not being there, for not doing this. I could just kick myself. I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm just... I think Art, Link, Art Linkletter thought of that. That he was, he missed out on an opportunity. I, you know, I, I, wish, I wish I had known uh, about Microsoft in, in the 70s. When Bill Gates was a college dropout and he approached some of his buddies and said, listen, we're going to start a software company and, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna revolutionize software, uh, 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 computer software or, 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 or be uh, the, the, the guy in the, in the, uh, uh, the garage 
with, uh, with, what's his name? Um, Steve Jobs, I couldn't remember his first name, uh, and, and, and be on the ground floor with Apple. There's, there's a guy in the Northgate Mall, he was, he was one of the guys that, that, was, that, that was right in there, right at the beginning of Microsoft, and bought just a few shares of Microsoft, and in a matter of a, a few years, the guy's worth millions, because Microsoft just exploded. You know, I could just... Go. <laughs> Why wasn't that my opportunity? <laughs> Most of you in the 70s didn't even know computers existed. I was, I was taking computer classes at UL. You see, you have to be in the right place physically. But you also have to be in the right place spiritually. Helen Keller said this, there, there are none so blind that those who will not see. You see, we can, be, we can have physical sight, but still be blind spiritually. Bartimaeus did not have physical sight, but I believe he had some spiritual sight. That he recognized that Jesus was there. He heard about Jesus. This is it. I believe he said, this is my chance. He sees the moment. You realize that your words and your actions will either seize the moment and change your life. Or it will forfeit the moment. And change your life. So our words and our actions are important. You see, at this moment for Bartimaeus, it was not time to be timid. It was not time to be cautious. It was not time to be afraid. See, Jesus is not moved by what you need. Jesus is not moved by the pain in your body. Jesus is not moved by the sickness and the condition that you have. Jesus is moved by faith. And the cry of faith will stop Jesus dead in his tracks. And it will cause him to turn around. Because he hears the voice of faith. He understands the voice of faith and responds to the voice of faith. That cry of faith will always capture Jesus' attention. And we, we can call out and Bartimaeus called out. But at that moment when he cried out the first time, what happened? There were those who were traveling with Jesus. Now, it doesn't say his disciples. It says some of the multitude, some who went before him, some who were traveling ahead of him, said, be quiet. Quiet down. Don't disturb the master. You see, all of us, listen, every one of us will have that, those same voices that'll tell us when we are in the, in the throes of that moment, we are on the threshold of that moment, we are right in the beginnings of that moment, there's going to be the voice of reason that's going to come out and say, man, you're just too far gone. It's too late. You'll never get anything from him. You, you, you know, he's, he's too busy to bother with one person. Hello, you hear the voice of saying, listen, you've been prayed with time and time again. You've been prayed with by the best of them. You've had hands laid on you. You've had oil laid on you till you felt like you took a bath in the oil, especially if you were at a Shambach meeting. And you were, you, 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 you just felt, you know, you've had all of these opportunities and you have come out of those none better. And, you know, you say, well, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's going to work this time the voice of uncertainty will keep you from trying that one more time 
the voice of summing failure. You know, the voice that says, man, you missed it. You've blown it as a husband. You've blown it as a man. You've blown it as a wife. You've blown it as a, as a father or as a mother. You've blown it. You, you've just made all these mistakes. You've done all of those things. And the, and the guilt begins to rise up. And the shame begins to rise up. And the thought that how could God do anything for somebody as wretched as me? You got to realize that you're the one he did it for. Amen. Amen. You're the one that Jesus came for. He didn't come. F- Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for those who need righteousness. I came for those who were the sinners. Those who missed it. I came for you. And so we recognize that we can't let those voices of doubt, those voices of religion, those voices of guilt, those voices of condemnation, those voices of failure to steal that moment and that time that's right there. And they said, be of good cheer. In other words, they said, take courage, boy. Just, just, it's, it's here, here it is. You know, now's your time. Just take courage. Be of good cheer. Be, be bold. Come on and, and get up because he's, he's calling for you. And so the word says that, that Bartimaeus Pardon the dark green. I'm not sure he wore that. Keep you awake. He took his jacket off. He took his coat off. And, and it says, and he cast it aside. It was, it was saying that he is taking his present position where he is. And you realize that that coat, that, that garment was his legal right to beg alms. And at that moment, he's saying, I am going into the presence of Jesus, and I'm not coming back to this street corner. I'm not coming back to this place. I'm not going to pick up that garment because I will not need it because from this moment on, my life will be different. And then Jesus asked him a question. (laughs) To me, it would have been like a a no-brainer. He comes before Jesus and the, the boy can't see. But you know, Jesus was wanting to find out where his faith was. So he asked him a question. What? Do you want me to do for you? And he said that I might recover. The word says there I might receive my sight. And actually the the, the Greek rendering of that could have been I want to recover my sight. Giving us the indication that he could see at one time but somewhere along the line got blind, was blinded and now he wants to recover his sight. He wants to see again. And Jesus, there's no indication that Jesus laid hands on him. In one case Jesus spit on the ground, made mud and put it in the guy's eye and said go wash at the pool of Siloam. And other times he laid hands on people but in this case he just said go your way your faith has made you well has made you whole and that word whole is the word sozo in the in the old in the new testament that word is is kind of a catch-all he says that that word uh he said that word that that your faith has saved you your faith has made you well your faith has made you whole your faith has preserved you your faith has changed your life has put you on solid ground and so he he just walked out and he just you know and and he received Immediately. Now watch this. The the word in Mark says he was directly he received his sight. In the book of Luke it says immediately he received his sight. Now those two words are, are not contradictory but they give us a little insight. You see, sometimes that moment 
we seize that moment and there's an instant change. There's an instant something. There's an instant recovery. There's an instant restoration. There's an instant healing that takes place. And thank God for that. But the word from Mark tells us that soon he recovered his sight. And so we have to recognize that if it doesn't happen immediately, it doesn't mean that the opportunity was missed. It doesn't mean that the moment and the, and the time frame had to be at that second and that instant. But rather, it can be a prolonged session, a prolonged period, a prolonged time frame where soon that miracle is going to take place. Soon that healing is going to take place. Soon that, that, that miracle, that touch from God will have activated and come to pass. I remember reading in, in, in Brother Hagin's books, the lady brought her daughter who had club feet uh, to be prayed for. And Brother Hagen prayed for the girl and, and, and that was nothing. Didn't see any change from the natural. Didn't see any change in her feet. And she was just discouraged. And Brother Hagen saw the discouragement. He says, don't let go your miracle." Don't let go this opportunity. Don't let it go, but stay on it. Keep speaking it. Call her feet normal. And three days later, she's giving her daughter a bath. And she starts hearing popping. And she starts hearing crackling. And she starts hearing all kind of things in the water. And she visually saw the baby's feet come out and change and grow the bones. And all the bones were normal. And she had the regular feet. And, 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 and her miracle took place, but it was three days later. So I'm saying that to say this, that we're going to share communion with you in just a little bit. I believe that it is, a, it is a moment of opportunity for the issues and the difficulties that you might be having in your life. And, and you may not see any change immediately. But don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Don't say, well, I guess I didn't get anything. No, just simply say, I have tapped into the anointing. I have tapped into the power of God. And I'm going to have my miracle. I'm going to come. I'm going to receive that that I need from the Spirit of God. And so when we receive communion, you see, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm ready to, I see these things in my spirit. I see people getting their, their miracle in here. And, and, but I'm ready to see it right here. Amen. And so I believe that this can be a, a, an opportunity for you. I, you know, there's, there's a number of people that, that, that I know should have been here this morning. Been contacting them and visiting with them during the week. And I'm going to be there Sunday. I'm going to be there Sunday. I got this. I got that. I got this. I, I'm going to be there Sunday. But they're not here. Doesn't mean they can't get it. Doesn't mean they'll have to do without it at least for a season. But what I'm saying is there's just one touch of the anointing, one touch of the glory, one touch of the, the, of, of the grace of God can change your life forever and the, the, your life will never, ever be the same. You're in, I believe, you're in position physically. Because I can see you. You're here. 
Some say, well, pastor, I can't be there in the natural, but I'm going to be there in the spirit. Well, that, that's, that's a good thing. You know, that's glad, I'm glad you, glad you pray and glad you, you feel like you're part. And, and, and sometimes that is what you have. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, Bartimaeus could have stayed home. And say, well, I'm there on the roadside, and I guess if anybody wants to give, they'll just put it in my bucket right there by the roadside. No, he'd have missed out on what God had intended for him. I believe this can be your moment. Now, and, now I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something, because I don't always, I don't believe that the physical healing that Bartimaeus received was the only thing he received. I believe there was some emotional healings that took place. I believe that there was some, some connections that were, that were lost, that were reestablished. You know, I believe that, it, you, you know, your, your need today, your miracle today might not be a physical miracle. It might be something emotional. It might be something relational. It might be something deep in here, deep in here. You, 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 may, you may need to be healed of, of rejection. You may need to be healed of bitterness. You may need to be healed of, of, of guilt, of, of any number of things. But I want you to know this morning that, that we may not see a physical manifestation in you because we look at you and you look good. You don't have any, you don't have any pains. You don't have any aches and pains. But so often we've put these barriers over us where I can't see your hurts and I can't see your pains and I can't see your aches and I can't see your loneliness and I can't see what's going on inside of you. But I got you, you got to know Jesus. Jesus knows what you need. Now, 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 Jesus said this. He says, the Father knows what you need before you ask. But we recognize that it doesn't mean we should not ask. It means he knows and he's ready and he's capable and he's willing and he, he knows and he's capable of handling anything that you have need of. And so this morning when we're going to take the communion elements in our hands, I want you to picture yourself standing in front of Jesus just as Bartimaeus did. And I'm going to ask you those questions. What do you want me to do for you? And you verbalize that within yourself. Or you say it softly. We don't need any, nobody else needs to know. Maybe something is just extremely personal and you don't need anybody else to know. It's not important except to you and Jesus. Amen.